thank you all for the welcome. Um, I'm speaking as a scientist and not as a uh, 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 regulator, and uh, the focus on this is going to be on the, the, the technical issues. So what I'm going to try to address today is uh, uh, three issues. Try to talk about how you would use uh, data uh, for risk findings for chemicals, and to answer the question of when are regulations of individual chemicals insufficient, and when do you need to go on to address mixtures. Second, to take a stab at trying to show how you can use the data to identify priority mixtures, um, and in particular to explore the role of exposure in identifying priority mixtures, trying to go beyond simply grouping chemicals together based upon a common mechanism of action. And then to talk about uh, how do you identify the drivers of mixtures. And that when you're looking at uh, a receptor that is ex exposed to multiple chemical stressors, which stressors are the most important? I use the term stressor, but actually I'm talking just about chemicals. So to, to demonstrate this, I'm going to take data that we just published, uh, Natalie Valentin and myself, uh, appeared in environmental science uh, just this summer, where we, uh, ex we used the maximum cumulative ratio as a uh, technique to evaluate a large data set of plant protection products that have been measured in more than 3,000 water samples taken from across the U.S. from the years 1992 to 2001 by the U.S. Geological Survey. This data set, we went into it, we culled all the ones where they didn't detect anything, and we only looked at samples where they had more than five detections, um, and uh, used a data set that was really intended to try to, to uh, uh, reflect a diverse uh, um, set of uh, meaningful mixtures of uh, plant protection products and their metabolites in uh, surface water. Uh, this data set was used originally to put in a paper where we looked at the human health impacts of it, and that was published in 2011. And in this paper, we looked at the ecological effects. Okay, in the data set, um, we have, uh, uh, as I said, over 3,000 samples. The uh, minimum number of uh, detects in there was five. We had as many as 29. The average was uh, nine. The non-detects uh, uh, were much larger, so they, they looked for a, 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 good, a goodly number of uh, plant protection products, uh, and non-detects, as I'll mention, wasn't an issue. Um, when you're trying to do this many substances, everyone here knows the big problem is trying to find the toxicity data for it. And fortunately for pesticides, um, it's, one, it's, it's, a data, it's a set of chemicals that has some of the best data out there. We were able to find uh, toxicity endpoints for the vast majority of the plant protection products for multiple trophic levels. Where we did not, we used a read-across approach. And in the read-across approach we used is that if it was a... Uh, a herbicide of a particular class, like a triazine, we picked the most toxic triazine that we could find. And if it was insecticide and it was organophosphorus, we used the most toxic organophosphorus. If it was a kind of one-off, it didn't have a category for it, we picked the most toxic uh, insecticide, the most toxic herbicide, as the basis to, to uh, uh, fill in the missing values. Uh, I, I recommend, if you're interested in the, in the details for this and how we address it, uh, to, to read the paper where it's, it's uh, nicely documented. Okay, so that's the data set we had to evaluate. And let me give a little uh, refresher for those of you who are familiar with the, the maximum, cumulative in, uh, uh, maximum cumulative ratio and uh, uh, the, other tech, uh, the other techniques that feed into it. And for those of you who aren't, you can, you can grab a nap. Um, but the hazard quotient hazard index approach has been around for more than 40 years um, for things like industrial hygiene standards, um, uh, setting soil standards at uh, Superfund sites. Um, it has a long history of use, and as we heard uh, Marco speak, it's, uh, for the last 20 years it's been used in ecological effects. Um, the hazard quotient is basically taking the dose and dividing it by a permitted dose, or in this case a concentration of water divided by an aquatic standard, and then summing them together to develop a hazard index. And the, uh, uh, the basis that's typically used is that if you have a value of less than one, you have a low concern, by greater than one, you have a high, higher concern, and probably need to do something. So uh, another way to look at the uh, hazard quotient approach is that the hazard quotient can be viewed as toxicity equivalents, where the weights are the inverse of the aquatic standards. The maximum cumulative ratio uh, builds on this to calculate uh, a measure of the relative contribution of a chemical with the largest impact to a receptor to the total impacts of all chemicals. Why would we want to do this? Um, 
Well, the combined toxicity is a measure of what you would get assuming additivity. And the maximum toxicity from any one chemical is what you would get if you use the assumption of independence. Uh, uh, Marian Jungams, who's here, has uh, indicated that in, in an earlier publication that preceded our work on the maximum cumulative ratio. And uh, in the case here, it's very easy to calculate the maximum cumulative ratio. It's simply the hazard index divided by the largest of the hazard quotients. Um, in this case, where we're looking at monitoring data, the hazard quotient hazard index at MTR are all a function of the concentrations in a particular sample, because that's what would, that's what would reach a receptor. And thus, the uh, values vary across the samples um, and can give us an idea of spatial and temporal uh, differences in toxicity and MCR. So uh, a little bit more background on why do we focus on MCR and how is it, what's, what is the role that it plays in decisions about how to manage risks? Um, this is an example which I've used numerous times before. Um, imagine two individuals, each exposed to five chemicals, each has a hazard index of 3.5, which being greater than one is unacceptable. The hazard quotients for the first individual are 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.7. And none of them are higher than, ha than one. The hazard quotients for the second individual are 3.2, 2.5, 0 0.04, 0 0.009, 0 0.001. These two individuals are quite different in terms of the management of their risks. If you had not done a cumulative risk assessment, you would have not identified there was an issue. Everyone passed um, the individual chemical specific uh, risk assessments. It is only when looked together that you realize you have a problem. The second indivi individual, you knew you had a problem and it was due to chemical number one. And the other ones weren't a problem. And if you did a cumulative risk assessment, you learned nothing more than this. There was a problem with chemical one, it needed to be addressed. Once it was addressed, the risk would go away. So there was little value in doing the cumulative risk assessment for the second person, but there was a great value for doing it for the first person. The MCR is simply a technique to take this pattern and turn it into a scalar number that can be evaluated uh, over uh, uh, large data sets. And the MCR is simply the total has an index divided by the largest uh, single component, and the value is 4.4 for the per first person uh, and 1.1 for the second. So the conclusion is, is that the closer that MCR gets to 1, the less, there is, the, the less value there is or need to perform a, cu a cumulative risk assessment. Um, and the value for cumulative assessment increases when MCR values are larger. Now, it's been pointed out by many people that uh, this is a little misleading because you can't calculate the MCR unless you've done a cumulative assessment. But it's really telling you that in that system, um, the, uh, the importance of cumulative exposures to understand the risk is what's meant here by saying the value of, of performing the MCR. The MCR has, has some nice mathematical prop, uh, properties. It's, it's bounded. It goes from 1 to n. Um, where uh, one is where one chemical totally dominates, n is where you have an equitoxic uh, mixture. Um, and a value of two indicates that 50% of the individual's toxicity comes from one chemical, and a value of 1.1 indicates that about 90% comes from the individual's toxicity. If we look at the pattern here, we can divide uh, the universe of mixtures into four subgroups. The first group uh, is a group of where one or more chemicals has a problem with the individual chemicals, that, that, the, that they've already exceeded the standard. So in combination, you, 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 from the cumulative risk, you find that you have worse uh, problem than you might have imagined, but you knew you had a problem to begin with. In category two, everything passes using a, 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 an additive model, and you conclude that the mixture risks here are probably of relatively low concern, and you ought to focus on something else. It's the ones that are in between, group three, um, that are the, the classic issue, where they pass individual uh, chemical by chemical basis, but fail when you add them together. And three can actually be divided into two groups. One group is where you have a chemical that you're pretty sure uh, that you know is the problem. That, that's, uh, right, right, see, there we go, right there. Um, that, that that one is pretty close to one, and that would be the one you would, you would you'd keep your eye on. And the, as these other ones are just enough to push it over. And then it's group three, uh, and we call that group 3A. And while it's a concern, it's a little bit less of a concern than the 3B, where they're all pretty close to one, and you don't know which one to focus on. That's the one that's really the mixture risk cap challenge. It's also the one that generates the larger hazard index. So uh, the advantage of those four bins is that you can plot them out nicely if you take and create a, uh, an MCR hazard index plot where on the y-axis you have MCR in a, in a uh, linear scale from 1 to n. Um, and on the uh, x-axis you have uh, 
the hazard index, which because the hazard index varies over orders of magnitude, you have to take the log of it to, to get it on something that fits well. If you do that, you find that these four different groups actually divide up very nicely. Is that uh, the, the vertical line at one uh, de delineates uh, all everything that's below one, and then uh, 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 above a hazard index of one, you can get there by either uh, having a hazard quotient greater than one or having no, uh, not having a hazard quotient greater than one, but having your, the sum of the hazard uh, quotients being greater than one. So here are the ones ex that exceed um, uh, a chemical by chemical risk assessment would have found them. Here are the ones that pass. Here are the ones that were missed when you didn't do a cumulative risk assessment. All right. So, um, I mean, before I show you the results, let me tell you a couple uh, caveats on it. Um, I told you we had missing toxicity data. We looked at the impact of the missing toxicity values, and, and it turns out they were pretty minor, that the substances that were missing the toxicity data turned out not to be drivers, and so it, they had very little impact on it. We did have a huge problem with detection limits. When we used the detection limits, uh, we found that, uh, uh, and we made an assumption that the non-detects were the detection limit divided uh, by two to the uh, one-half power, or square root of two. Uh, we had the non-detects added up to a, to a hazard index of greater than one. So just on the basis of the non-detects, uh, you could not tell if you had a problem or not. So what we did is we went through them chemical by chemical and figured out where the driver. We found a subgroup of about five to 10 uh, uh, chemicals that uh, the detection limits were very high in comparison to the uh, uh, aquatic toxicity values. And we essentially said that we can't reach a decision on those chemicals. Uh, we can reach a decision on the other chemicals, um, but those, um, uh, we simply don't have sufficient analytical chemistry to allow you to address it. We noted that, and then we went on to say, uh, let's go ahead and, and, and recognize that's a limitation, but investigate what patterns do we get if we make the assumption that, that uh, the contributions uh, from these uh, non-detects for even these five or 10 chemicals are, are, are negligible. And so that is a caveat and uh, uh, that needs to be kept in mind in the results I present. So here are the results. This is a, a tier one uh, assessment, and we did two tiers. I'll talk about the second one in a moment. And in the tier one assessment, we took the lowest hazard uh, acute toxicity uh, value from any trophic level and used that as the basis for determining our uh, hazard quotients. And we get this uh, sort of cloud. Oops, there we go. There we go. This nice cloud here where. Um, uh, great. Um, where we have about 20% uh, of the samples exceeded one of their water quality standards. Some of them exceeded them by a very large amount. Um, and then uh, we had about 11% fell into categories 3A and 3B, and the remainder uh, passed the, the, the criteria. So this is a pretty uh, uh, significant finding. And one of the things that you need to keep in mind when you look at it is that um, the data, the monitoring data comes from uh, the 1990s, the analytical, the, the water quality criteria were not developed until 10 and sometimes 15 years later. So no one ever did th this risk assessment. This is a, this is a, a retroactive risk assessment. Um, the other thing that's important to note is that given the shape of the cloud, the ones that, that were missed did not have large hazard indices. They fall between one and three. The ones that really had the large uh, hazard indices uh, uh, fell in group one. So uh, we did a tier two assessment following the guidance of uh, Bachhaus and Faust, which was to, to, to go ahead and, and look at uh, sorting our, uh, our, our water quality standards uh, based upon different trophic levels. So we looked at four different trophic levels. Um, we only analyzed uh, the, the, uh, uh, the group ones that fell, the, the, the samples that fell into group three. The reason for this is that group one would still be in group one, no matter how you did it, because you had one chemical that was already above uh, uh, the hazard quotient. Group three, I'm uh, sorry, group two wouldn't change at all because if you divide things up, the hazard indice just goes down, and so these things would still be safe. These are the ones that are really affected. Uh, it's their status changes in doing the analyses. So here's the result for uh, fish and ver vertebrates, non-vascular plants and vascular plants. And what you can see pretty quickly is that fish aren't really affected. Vascular plants aren't being affected. Non-vascular plants, some of the mixtures have moved to uh, group two, uh, lower concern, uh, but some have not. 
invertebrates, some have moved to group two, but some have not. And so um, we, we were able to show that, uh, that of, the, of all the uh, 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 samples that fell into group three, um, about one third remained uh, as being concerned for invertebrates, about one third remained for, uh, for non-vascular plants, um, and that, uh, uh, that when you, uh, I'm sorry, one third for non-vascular plants, and when you looked at them together, uh, about half of them still remained to, to, to be a concern for either non-vascular or, or invertebrates. So the analysis said that we do have, we have identified mixtures uh, which, which uh, uh, would not have been detected on the basis of a uh, uh, chemical by chemical assessment. Is that a signal that I'm running late? No. Okay, there, very good. Good, because <laughs> I still have slides left. All right, so that's the findings. That's in the paper. Please, please order the paper. Please cite it. I'd like to have my H index go up. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I was very pleased to, to, to see that we got it out. So now I'd like to take the, that data and see what does that data tell us about the three questions. Um, what is the importance of mixtures versus single chemicals, how to identify priority mixtures, and how to identify the drivers of mixtures. So the first question, um, when is the regulation of individu individual chemicals insufficient? Well, clearly, we found that, the, that it was. Uh, we found that uh, everything that's in this wedge-shaped area here um, would have been caught in a cumulative assessment, and this is the, this is the data from uh, the two trophic levels, invertebrates and numbers. I'm going to show you all the data. Um, and that uh, uh, you would have missed them. But the highly toxic ones, the ones that are really driving uh, the, the impacts, the, the nasty samples, would have been caught by chemical by chemical assessment. So you can't say that you are missing the highest risk. What you've missed is a modest difference in the, uh, uh, in, in the population of things that are sort of uh, uh, a concern, but not hugely a concern. Um, and so the, the conclusion here is that, yes, this was important, but you can't really say that this wasn't important in terms of uh, uh, there were high risks that were missed. It's, it's that uh, we, the size of the risk would have, uh, uh, the magnitude of the overall concern about us would have been slightly lower uh, uh, had you not done a cumulative risk assessment. You would have still concluded that many of these samples contained uh, exposures to pesticides of significant concerns. Okay, the next question. So given uh, exposed to multiple chemical stressors, which stressors are important? Well, this is a nice way of taking the data and, and enhancing it. What I've done here is I've taken the plot of the, of the data for um, uh, non-vascular plants, and I've simply color-coded which is the driver uh, for the chemical that, uh, uh, was, that had the largest hazard index. And so you get a nice three-level information. Here are the ones that are highly toxic. If they're low here, you know one chemical was the driver. Below two means, means that it gave at least 50% of the toxicity. And the color tells you which one it is. So you look at this and say, wow, the overall impression is the US had an atrazine problem in the 1990s for invertebrates. This is not a new finding. It's well been recognized and the standards for atrazine have been made more stringent since then. However, we can see that there are a couple of other ones here. There's another triazine, the, the, the sanazine is, is showing up here significant numbers. Acetochlor is showing up here. Diuron is showing up here. Um, and uh, uh, diuron is really pretty low H, uh, uh, MCR value, so it indicates that it's pretty much act, acting as, a, uh, as, a, as an agent all in of itself. Uh, we've got a couple of... Uh, 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 and then as you shift back here, you find that the drivers start to change. Uh, other is all the other ones that, are, that aren't these. Uh, but you go back here and you start seeing uh, molinate showing up uh, a couple of places. Um, the, the blue triangles back here are, are metolachlor. And metolachlor is a driver, but it's a driver for things that have very low hazard indices. So this was the point I think we came up in our group, is that simply asking what's the driver of a mixture doesn't tell you a lot if that mixture is pretty darn non-toxic. What do you want to know or what are the drivers out here? And so the conclusion you come away from here is we've got four drivers that we really ought to focus on in terms of this. And as I said, MCR, uh, color coding at MCR really helps communicate uh, what the data is telling you. Okay. So what's the role in, uh, so the third question, what's the role of uh, exposure potential in identifying priority mixtures? Well, as we all know, the priority mixtures, grouping things to identify uh, things, should uh, take into account the toxicity. You should look at things that have a common adverse outcome pathway um, so that you have a good degree of confidence that, uh, that, that they are actually going to add together uh, when, you, when you have co-occurrence. Uh, co 
uh, in the environment. However, it's also important to recognize is that if you have in the environment two chemicals that operate by the same mechanism of action, but one of them is a thousandfold lower than the other on a toxicity weighted equivalent, is that adding them together didn't get you much. Is that you went from 1,000 to 1,000. Point one, uh, in terms of your hazard quotient when you add together. The important thing is to understand is when in the environment do we see, do we see co-occurrence of exposures that, that really change the decision? When are they close enough together that when you add them, they take you from below one in the hazard index to above them? Um, and so that's, um, so that's what I think we'd like to try to do. So what I've done is I've said that why don't we focus on um, the, the group in, uh, uh, let's see if I can do this, yeah. The, the group that's here in, uh, in group three falls in this wedge. Look at those, look at the drivers on them. And then I said, well, how many of the drivers do I have to look at? Do I have to look at the top one, the top two, and the top three? Well, the MCR gives you some clue. If the MCR is generally doesn't get much above two, and I didn't get any above three in, in these here, that's telling you that the top one is providing at least 50%. And so I went back and looked at the data, and I felt that on average, uh, uh, the top two contributors for these, chem for these chemicals provided about nine, for all of my data, uh, some of the top two contributors contributed more than 90%. And I said, ah, let me look at that a little closer. So I looked at it a little bit closer, and here is the cumulative distribution of the fraction of the hazard index that comes from the top chemical, which is here in black, and the top two chemicals, which is here in red, and the dotted lines are where I just looked at the data for, for uh, mixtures that had a hazard index greater than one. And what you can see, that 90% that of the uh, mixtures uh, had just under half of the uh, toxicity uh, uh, coming from the first chemical. And if you went to the second chemical, uh, it goes up to about 75. And if you look at the ones that are greater than one, it, you've got over 80% of them coming from the top two chemicals. So I said, that's a pretty good justification that we ought to look at these binary pairs, the first and the second one. And so that's what we did in the paper. Um, and so. Uh, here is the pairs that showed up, and I just looked at uh, uh, group 3B. These are the ones where none of them dominate, and, and the, the, diff and the uh, MCR values are the largest. Um, and I found that out of all the data, and there were about 80 different pesticides we were looked at, we really got a very small handful. And so this is just another confirmation of the dirty dozen uh, a Pareto principle, is that even in complex mixtures, it's, it's, it's a small number of actors. So what really leapt out is that we had seven diazinon chlorpyrifos, five diazinon carbaryl, five diazinon malathion. I uh, said so these were important uh, uh, issues for the invertebrates. If, you, if we started looking at some of the other ones that happened just one at a time, we picked a couple other uh, organophos, other uh, uh, carbamate um, uh, came in. And if we look at the non-vascular plants, we can see there's atrazine showing up and acetochlor, cyanosine, and uh, alichlor and diuron showing up uh, in smaller numbers. Um, so the conclusion that you come from this is that you get this common pool of about five organic phosphorus pesticides, two carbamates, and then one additional uh, plant protection process on the invertebrate, two triazines, two uh, chlorocetalides, and uh, one phenylurea uh, for the non-vascular. So I would look at this and say, this data set just told me there's five organic phosphorus phosphor, uh, pesticides that look like they, they provided a cluster both on the basis of exposure and mechanism of action for them. All right, summary of the findings. Um, the MCR demonstrates that the combined effects in this data set had a modest impact. They changed the finding for only about 3% um, of the samples. This was after we did the, uh, 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 going to the second trophic level. The largest risk did not happen in the chemicals that were, that were driven by uh, combined exposures, but were driven by, uh, that happened in chemicals where one uh, PPP, one or more PPPs exceeded the aquatic standard. And these risks would have, not, would have largely been detected had you used single chemical assessments. The majority of the toxicity came from the top two components of the mixtures, suggesting that priority mixtures in this data set were binary combinations. The number of, uh, the combination of toxicity that were concerned involved only a small number of compounds, which may provide the basis for identification of priority uh, mixtures. And this work, um, I'm very careful to, to caveat this, this work is presented as an illustration of the use of MCR and related, related techniques to investigate impacts of combined exposures reflected in historical monitoring data. It is not reflecting of uh, 
current, in, uh, current standards. The monitoring data is more than 20 years old. And so all of the presentations I've made here should not be uh, uh, taken as uh, EPA conclusion or suggestions over what should be done with current plant protection products here or elsewhere. And then uh, my final caveat is that all of this work was reviewed by EPA and, and approved for presentation. It does not necessarily reflect agency policy. And I can't complete the paper without acknowledging that the bulk of this work was uh, done by Dr. Natalie Valentin and Dr. Jean Lou Han, who both worked with me uh, on the earlier publications. So thank you very much.